All right, hey everybody, uh, we're gonna get started. Um, this is a webinar and it is part of our uh, summer lecture series. And our summer lecture series uh, is a series of lectures that we're developing uh, to teach quantitative finance topics using um, all the different components of our platform. We think we have a pretty unique way to actually teach these topics because people can uh, try all the things that they're learning um, rather than just learn them. Um, and just as a quick reminder, uh, I'm actually currently working on getting a page out that will host all the lectures to make it much easier to access. But in the meantime, uh, if you search Quantopian Lecture on the forums, um, you'll see all the posts that we've made uh, relating to the, uh, the summer lectures. So uh, I'll show you, there's one um, post that we have here that should uh, link to all of them. And this is just more evidence that um, I need the, uh, the, the permanent page. But this post, uh, we're kind of updating this post to have information on uh, all the upcoming lectures and the links back to um, the previous lectures and the, and the contents. Uh, we did webinars like this for the other lectures, so you can go back and review those. Um, today, we're gonna be working on the You Don't Know How Wrong You Are lecture, and that includes content from uh, Kalman Filters, this post, Overfitting, this post, and the Umbrella post, You Don't Know How Wrong You Are. So. These are the posts that we're gonna be drawing on. These are the notebooks that we use to present uh, at the uh, in-person meetup. And you can go ahead and clone these notebooks uh, at any time if you want to um, follow along or try stuff yourself or anything like that. So, uh, we're just gonna, gonna go ahead and get started. Um, one last thing is uh, I'm gonna actually try a new thing, which is um, instead of releasing one long one hour video, which is the entire webinar, we're gonna try to release uh, one video for each notebook. So I'm gonna leave a deliberate pause uh, once I finish presenting um, the first uh, notebook and then once I finish presenting the second notebook. Uh, don't worry, the webinar hasn't ended. I'm just pausing to make sure I can edit between them uh, afterwards. So the first thing we're going to talk about uh, is instability of parameter estimates. Now what is a parameter estimate? Well pretty much uh, everything you estimate is a parameter and this includes things like the mean and standard deviation. Uh, the mean and standard deviation are parameters to the normal distribution. Um, and it's important to think of them that way if you're going to make any kind of predictions. Uh, so another important point is, again, like you never know, you only estimate. One big uh, fallacy I hear a lot is people will say, oh, the beta of a stock is 0.79. Well, it's not. That's a beta over a specific time period at a specific sampling frequency from a specific data set um, computed using a specific technique. And if you ran it over different time periods or at different sampling frequencies, that beta would change wildly. So it's kind of, it's not very useful to say the beta is this when it basically there's a huge amount of uh, instability around that estimate. There's a huge amount of variance, or as they say kind of more rigorously, there's, there's standard error. Um, so you have to be aware of the standard error when you're taking an estimate. So I'll show you some examples of this. Uh, and we'll get down to an example, a real world example of the Sharpe ratio. So uh, with the, the first example is just mean and standard deviation. I said before, like these are not actually just quantities you can measure. They're also parameters to the normal distribution. So if we take um, 500 uh, randomly generated numbers from a normal distribution that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, uh, what we can see is as we take bigger and bigger sample sizes, uh, we're gonna get closer and closer um, to uh, having basically a mean that, that accurately reflects, uh, and a standard deviation that ac accurately reflects um, the mean and standard deviation of the true underlying distribution. So you can see here this tiny little sample size doesn't really tell us anything. If we were just look at this green one, we'd say, oh, this distribution is super skewed because it's, it's not normal at zero at all. The mean might be over here. 
Um, then at this red one, it gets, so it's getting a little better. And then finally, this, this purple one is kind of the most representative that we have. Um, and uh, you can see the standard deviation here also starts converging to one uh, as you run it. And so like sometimes you might run this and it might look pretty good the whole way through. But if you, if you ran this experiment a ton of times, you'd see that on average, the standard deviation is pretty far away. Uh, there's a large amount of variance. Uh, when you're looking at a small sample size. So that's just like a classic example if you just don't have enough, if your sample size isn't big enough, you can have a high amount of variance in this thing you're trying to measure. Now let's have another example. This is a fun gotcha example, which is let's say that you're modeling returns, right? Um, and this is gonna be an extreme example, but I'll, I'll talk about why it's actually fairly common in a bit. But let's say you're modeling returns and you're like, hmm, I wanna model my returns as a normal distribution. That's the default, right? You, you always say like, let's model things with a normal distribution unless you have evidence that it's not. Um, so in this case, what I'm gonna show you is, uh, what if it's something that looks more like this, right? What if this is your underlying distribution? So you take the mean, well, that's zero basically, and you take the standard deviation, the standard deviation is five. So you're like, great, my normal distribution that I'm using to model my returns has a mean of, standard, a mean of zero, standard deviation of five. So let's regenerate a normal distribution, let's sample from a normal distribution. These are, this is the guesses you'd be making. You'd be making guesses that are all around here mostly, and you'd be completely wrong because in the true underlying process, um, none of the data is coming from that region. So this is just an example of uh, kind of a way that you have to look at how right are your estimates? Is there instability? Uh, is there high variance on your estimates? Um, so one of the things you can do just as a quick gotcha is uh, you can do a normality test. And this is just one that I like. It's very easy to import. It's two lines of code. You run it in your data and these two lines could potentially save you a lot of pain and suffering later when your algorithm isn't working. Um, so if you are making an assumption that something is normally distributed and that assumption includes taking the mean and using it to predict, taking the standard deviation and using it to predict, if your algorithm is taking the mean and standard deviation of something and that something is not normally distributed, your algorithm is likely not gonna work. So a quick check that you can do on your data to make sure it's normally distributed is you do the shark vera test. And if this p-value is below 0 0.05, you say this data is not normal. I can't use this mean and standard deviation. I need to fit another distribution. Something's wrong, right? And so in this case, you can see the p-value is below 0 0.05. So we would say this distribution it's not normal. And we're not gonna try to model it with a normal distribution, which is good because as you can see, if we tried to model it with a normal distribution, we'd end up making a lot of really bad guesses and our algorithm would be predicting things very wrong. So um, the Sharpe ratio uh, is, is pretty ubiquitous. Um, it's used a lot. It's kind of like one of the best single measures of algorithm performance. Um, but I'm gonna show you again why it's super important not to just take a quote unquote sharp ratio. You need to take a sharp ratio and also look at the variance around that estimate. So um, here what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this uh, bill ETF as a stand in for the treasury curve so that we can actually compute a sharp ratio. Um, this is just kind of a, a hand wavy way to do it, but it's fine for the example. And we're gonna compute the sharp ratio of Amazon um, so that, that's all we're doing. We're computing the Sharpe ratio and we're computing it using the, the 90 day look back window. So this is the Sharpe ratio over the last 90 days. Okay. And you can see here, this is what it looks like. Okay. It's pretty wild, right? So what was, where's the danger here? The danger here is, um, let's say that you took the Sharpe ratio estimate. You just, ha this happened to be the day you were taking it on, right? And this could be any day but you took it here and you said, hmm, the Sharpe ratio of Amazon right now is uh, something between zero and 0 0.05, right? And you say, so that's what I'm gonna use for my algorithm. But look at the uncertainty around that estimate. If you had taken it that day, within a, within a short amount of time, it's actually gonna be over on the other end of zero. It's gonna be a positive Sharpe ratio. And likewise, if you took it up here and then all of a sudden it crashes to here, uh, basically your sharp rating ratio in this case is kind of meaningless. Um, so what you have to do is you have to say, what's my variance? If I take, if I use my estimate and then I pretend I'm in a different day 
and I take a bunch of different estimates pretending I'm on different days, how much noise is there around my estimate? And what you can see here is here's the standard deviation, right? This is the standard error of your estimate. And so you would actually have to say, is my algorithm okay? Uh, given that the measurement I've taken is here, is my algorithm okay with being two or three standard deviations above that and two or three standard deviations below that, right? Because really, if you want your algorithm to be ironclad, you have to be okay with your estimate plus or minus three standard deviations, right? That's like the point at which you actually start saying, I have high probability that this is gonna work. Um, so in this case, basically what you're saying is, your algorithm could be, the Sharpe ratio of uh, Amazon could be up here, or it could be down here. Is your algorithm okay with both of those cases? If yes, great, go ahead. If not, if it's not okay with it being negative two, uh, point two, then you should probably reconsider your strategy because there's a strong chance that it could be negative point two and there's just error in your measurement. Um, another example is, Moving average. So moving average actually tends to be prone to huge amounts of overfitting. And I'll talk about that in the next notebook, which actually deals in overfitting. Um, but uh, so in the moving average, you have to define a look back window, just like we did for the sharp. You compute the sharp ratio over some period of time. You compute a moving average over some period of time. And a moving average is usually used to try to determine what's the underlying state of um, a stock right, or, or something, some quantity you're measuring. What's the underlying price? What's the true price getting rid of all this noise? But of course, you have a trade-off, which is, so if we look here um, at a rolling average, uh, this is over a particular look-back window, which is 90 days, um, and you can see it kind of moves along with the price, uh, but the longer windows, you can see, tend to have a huge amount of lag because it takes 90 days basically to incorporate the new information that it's getting fully. Um, so you can see like it spikes here and then the moving average kind of doesn't spike for a while and then it drops a lot and then the moving average starts to drop but it doesn't really drop for a while. So you can basically be running behind the market with a long rolling average, with a long uh, moving average. On the other hand, a uh, short moving average um, can lead to problems when you're just incorporating a lot of noise, okay? And actually, one of the ways to solve this problem is to use uh, what's called a Kalman filter, which will be the subject of the third notebook. So I'll go into like how to deal with this problem of choosing a window size in a bit. But the one thing I want to talk about is um, the moving average is itself an estimate, right? You're estimating something, so there's noise. So you're saying, uh, what's the mean of the moving average? Well, it's this number, and the standard deviation of the moving average is this number. And you need to consider both because when you take the moving average, you're saying, okay, well, I'm going to estimate that this is the price, but over time, how much fluctuation is there in the price? Because if there's a huge amount of fluctuation, any estimate I take of the, like, the true underlying price uh, is prone to a huge amount of noise. So you say, what's the standard deviation? Well, the standard deviation is, is 50 over this time period. But the thing to remember is that um, the standard deviation is itself another estimate. It's an estimate of the standard deviation of an estimated quantity, right? So it has, you can plot it over time, what the standard deviation looks like, and you see the standard deviation has a huge fluctuation, um, and it has a mean, and it has a standard deviation itself. So the point I'm trying to make here is that pretty much everything ha is an estimate, and everything, um, everything you kind of have some uncertainty around and and the point is just drill down far enough until you've crunched that uncertainty to the point that you're comfortable and that and that comfort point is different for everybody it depends on how much risk you're willing to take on what type of strategy you're running how robust your strategy is to different potential underlying states um but but the idea here is just at least do that first step of if you're taking an estimate take that estimate at many points in time see how much it wiggles around and if it wiggles a lot, then say, maybe this estimate is just not useful to me as a trading signal, rather than just taking the estimate at one point in time and saying, this is how the world works. I don't even worry about the variance. Um, and then uh, this last plot is just showing you, like, this is the moving average plus or minus one standard deviation. And so this is like saying, OK, well, if we assume a normal distribution for the moving average, which we'd have to test using the Jacques Barra test. We don't even know if it's normal, but at least it's better than nothing. We say if we assume a more normal distribution, uh, this is the range in which I have to be comfortable 
with my with my underlying price line. So if your algorithm's comfortable with this range being okay, uh, if your algorithm would be okay if the price were anywhere in here, then you can say, okay, this is fine. I can use this moving average, right? Likewise, if you're trying to figure out if two prices are actually different, you'd probably want to do something along the lines of saying, how much mo noise is there in the price? Uh, take the moving averages, uh, or not moving average, take the, take the mean standard deviation. Is the, do the variance windows overlap? You know, is the, is the highest possible true price uh, measurement, uh, the true price given the measurement, uh, higher than the lowest possible of the other price? And if they overlap, then you say, hmm, maybe the prices aren't actually different. Maybe it's just measurement error. And this is basically getting back to the whole statistical principle of the z-test. Um, again, the, the, the main point here is just don't take single measurements. Never in your algorithm should you have a moving average. You take it every day and you use it. You should have a moving average. You should be keeping track of how much that moving average is moving. If you're taking a sharp ratio, you should be keeping track of how much that sharp ratio is moving. And you should be um, incorporating the amount of movement into your algorithm so that you can discredit signals when they aren't giving you useful information.